Good morning, Freedom Gate family. My name is Ayanda, and I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday service. If you are joining us for the first time, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you. Welcome, enjoy a cup of coffee after the service, and we hope you enjoy your time. Here are this week's announcements. On the 8th of June, we are having a Moms and Tots morning at 8 a.m. right here at the church. If you are a mom that has a tot, bring them along for an awesome time of fellowship, playing, um, and all the things that tots do. Um, yeah, come, come through for that. Then on the 10th of June, we are having a volunteers training morning from 9 a.m. till 12 p.m. Uh, it's followed by lunch, so come for the lunch um, and the training. Um, uh, so it's going to be good. So if you are a volunteer, volunteer or you're going to sign up today because it's volunteer Sunday if you're going to sign up to volunteer please come to that training it's going to be a great time of equipping then you know what I'm about to say HBC is coming up from the 10th to the 14th of July it's going to be an incredible time right here on the church property tons of kids uh, it's going to be an epic week learning about Jesus playing games um, so bring your kids along to that then for HPC um, a part of it is our snack time and so every year when HPC comes around um, we uh, yeah, give give you the opportunity to partner with us um, in serving the kids um, so we'd like to invite you if you are able to bring juice biscuits oranges um, just snacks um, good healthy snacks um, for the kids to munch on during the week or if you'd like to make a financial contribution um, there's the the church's banking details at the info desk please do that partner with us if you're maybe not able to volunteer um, that's one of the ways that you can come alongside and support HBC as well so uh, please do that it's gonna be awesome uh, enjoy our Sunday service if you have a toddler in the house you can take them to the um, bottom cabin for toddler time otherwise enjoy the service um, and yeah see you. Jude that, that, that Jude, Jude wrote it's one chapter um, but to really do it justice you'd have to spend quite a bit of time in it when you do when you do a letter like like the, the, the letter to the Ephesians there's six chapters if I was going to work through it um, in a way that really, really gets into all the, the nitty gritties. We'll be doing Ephesians still next year. So that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to pull out little bits and pieces of Ephesians and just help to, to uh, just give us some kind of idea of the book. Um, but that's not the, the, the real purpose of it is what does God want to, what does God want to put inside of you and me through the letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church? And uh, what I'm really trusting the Lord for is that the gospel again will just come alive for us. Uh, we can never move away from the gospel. We can never move away from the gospel. We can never get too clever for the gospel. Never get too mature for the gospel. And uh, I, just, I just felt like it's time again to just, just dig back into what Jesus has done for us. And uh, so that's how we're going to work through um, the letter to the Ephesians. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. So Paul, Paul arrived in Ephesus. He, he did a few trips. And on his third trip, he arrived in Ephesus and spent some time there. He spent a couple of years in Ephesus um, uh, discipling people and teaching and training people. And, and what, what ended up developing there was this beautiful church. And the amazing thing about um, the letter to the Ephesians is that Paul doesn't have anything um, kind of negative to say about them. He is incredibly positive about this church in Ephesus. This is a, an amazing church. This is a happening church. And this is a church that's really on the map. You've got to remember, this is also a church that Jesus speaks to through through John in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 2, John, um, Jesus gives messages to seven different churches. And uh, uh, we, when you read those letters to those churches, you realize that at any point in any one of our lives, we can land up in the same situation that those churches found themselves in. All, all seven churches were alive and well at the same time, um, and, uh, but they were all going through different things. And uh, we all go through different things individually, and we also go through different things as a church. And something we can learn from the Ephesian church is they were a church that was on fire. They were passionate about Jesus. They were on fire. They were a church that loved the Lord. And you can see as you read through this letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians, he's incredibly proud of this church. Um, he, he loves this church. He loves what God, and I say proud in a good way. He loves what God is doing in this church, and he's spurring them on into the future. But something we've got, there's, there's a warning for us in that because we see John prophesying over the church in Ephesus in, the, in, in Revelation, and we see that they had lost some things. And so it's important to realize that we can be doing, we can really be running with fire and passion, following the Lord, and then get to a point in our lives where we lose some things. And what, what happened to the Ephesian church years down the line is that they had lost their first love. They had lost that, 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 that love for God that they had at the beginning. And I would like to 
suggests that when Paul writes to the Ephesians at this moment, they haven't lost their first love yet. He's writing to them and they are, they are on the go and they're doing things and they're really moving forward in God and he is encouraging them. But at some point down the line, a few years down the line, it wasn't that much further down the line, but at some point down the line, they got to the point where they had kind of got a little bit kind of just lost their first love, a little bit lukewarm, a little bit like, you know, they, had, they, they, they were holding some strong lines on certain things, but they had lost their passion for Jesus. And so as we go through this and as we read what Paul is saying to these Ephesians today, it's very important for us to realize that we, must, we, we mustn't forget these things. Because if we forget these things, if we move away from the gospel, we move into a place of religion. You with me? And the last, the last thing that any of us would want as, as part of Freedom Gate Church is that Jesus comes and says, I'm going to remove your lampstand if you don't go back to the things you did at first. You don't go back to your first love. And the removal of the lampstand really is the removal of influence. There are many churches around the world that have lost their influence. There was, a, there was the, the day when they were, they were running for the Lord and they were bearing much fruit and things were growing and things were happening. But then it got to the point where maybe they, did, they, 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 they made decisions similar to the Ephesian church and the, the love died down and they just got cold. And those churches, they still exist, but there's very little actually happening. It's very little. It's, it's, it's like Jesus has come and removed the lampstand. The, removing the lampstand is not taking away your salvation. That's not what God does. You and I, we've given our lives to Jesus Christ. We're in his hand. He's keeping us. And he's a faithful God. And he is keeping us. But what, what the lampstand being removed is, is removing your, your, your influence, removing your reach, removing your witness for Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit moves on and he goes somewhere else. And he carries on doing what he is doing. The church that Jesus is building um, carries on growing, carries on advancing. But God, uh, God uh, moves away from certain places and certain spaces. Am I making sense? So we don't want to be that kind of church, right? And uh, I'm really encouraged by what God is doing in Freedom Gate at the moment. That um, There's new faces. As some of you have been in the church maybe for a couple of weeks. And uh, you've, you've, you, you feel like this is a place that you can connect with. And there's, there's people here, hopefully friendly faces. Um, maybe you feel uh, a sense of mission with us. That we can, we can go with God together on mission for what he's called us to do in discipling the nations. And that's really awesome. But we've got to remember that God, God's heart for this church is that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years, 200 years down the line, we haven't lost that. But that there's a growth and an increase. Um, if you are under the age of 20, can you stand quickly? I'll put you on the spot. If you're under the age of 20, can you stand? Look at all these wonderful, amazing people. Look at these wonderful young people. It just bless you with more of the power of God, the Holy Spirit in your lives, that you will follow him wholeheartedly. That when these young people are under the age of 20, when they're 40, 50, 60, if some of them are still in the South Coast region, that they will be part of revival taking place in this space. They'll think back to these days and be like, oh, those days were, were quite conservative compared to what God is doing now. Amen? Amen. We love you guys. You can sit, you can sit down. But these are, the, these are the guys who are going to, you know, we, God uses every single one of us, right? While you're still alive on this earth, he's using you. But the younger people will probably be alive a little bit longer than some of us older people, right? Um, some of you got only like 30, 40 years to go. Yeah, depending on if you listen to Moses or listen to God. God said 120 years. Moses got irritated with the people and said 70. And then most people, most people decided to go with Moses. God never changed his mind, but everyone goes like 70. That's good. We'll go 70. Um, but whatever it, whatever it works out to, if you are old, if you're, if you're above the age of 50, you're, you're mature. <laughs> Nora, Nora, <laughs> Nora's 87, so she's only got about 30 years to go or so. Um, so you got 20. Are oh, you going to 120? So you've got 30-something years to go then. Yeah, there we go, 33. Sorry, I cut you short there. But, um, but, uh, but the point is that when we're all gone, this church has still got a purpose. There's still a lampstand that God has placed here, and we need to make sure we don't, we, it's our job to fight the battles we're called to fight now, to hold fast to the things we're meant to hold fast to now, so that 50, 60, 70 years down the line, others are building on what God did in our lives. Amen? Amen. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that, he should be, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, to which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now that's already so much to absorb just there as we read the first six verses. That's a lot to absorb. That's a lot to take in. If you carry on reading, Paul just carries on. He's like, it's almost like he gets so excited about what God has done, about what Jesus has come, came to this earth to do, and so excited about what he's doing in this, in this church that he just starts, he's like, this God has done, and he's done this, and he's done that, and this has happened, and this has happened, and this has happened, and he carries on. He, it's almost like he, he, when, as you're reading it, it feels like he's not even taking a breath. He's just like, he's trying to write, as, or whoever's writing for him, he's trying to write as fast as possible as he's just telling them the amazing things that God has done. Which is why I'm stopping at verse 6, because I feel like just to introduce today, we need to just work through those verses and uh, see what God wants to say to us. So, first of all, I want to I wanna just point out that, that Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And I really want to just speak into every single one of our lives this morning and say, do you know what God has called you to? You know, the amazing thing about Paul is he knew what God had called him to. He was very, he, there was no insecurity in his life, lack of identity, kind of moving a little bit here, moving a little bit there. He knew his purpose. He knew what he was called to, and he knew it because God had spoken to him. See, Paul wasn't doing what he'd done because he thought it was a great idea. He wasn't doing what he was doing because, you know, it looks nice. Somebody else did it. I feel like I can do the same thing. In fact, at that, t- at that stage, I'd say what Paul was doing is probably one of the most dangerous jobs. You know, he kept getting whipped and beaten and you know, left for dead and stoned and all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, hungry. Sometimes he went hungry. Sometimes he had food. Sometimes he was, he was um, out in the ocean floating around on a piece of, on a piece of wood all night, as he says. Um, and he calls all these things light and momentary afflictions. And he does all these things because God called him. And the challenge that we have as Christians, especially in the 21st century, in 2023, the 4th of June, 2023, the challenge we have is, is one of the things we've lost is this thing of commitment and faithfulness for the long haul. And I think if some, if, if, okay, let me say it like this. I shouldn't say it like this, but I'll say it like this. People down the road, you know, you know those guys down the road. But sometimes we can, we, we, we find it too easy to, when the going gets tough, we jump out of the, of the game. And we, we, we do something different. We, like, we pull out of things. But there is, there is the lost art of commitment and faithfulness of I keep pushing through no matter how difficult and how tough it is because God spoke. See, when you have a word, word from God and you hold on to that word, that can get you and I through anything. And maybe some of us are here today and you're in the room and you're like, well, you know, I'm, I am flitting around this side, that side. I don't, know, I don't quite know what to do with my life. I, I, or I've been moving in a certain direction for a while, but I'm feeling a little bit uncertain about where I need to go next. I really want to encourage you, before you do anything else, and before you make any decision, get with Jesus. Spend time with him. And then don't, don't stop until you have an answer. You say, well, that could take a while. Well, it depends on how, how hard of hearing you are. And I, I mean that quite seriously. Sometimes we hear quite clearly and sometimes we don't hear that well. And sometimes it takes time before, before we actually start to hear what it is that God is saying to us. We think, think about Daniel. I don't know how all these things work, but I know Daniel prayed and then he was fasting for three weeks for an answer. And eventually an angel arrives and says to Daniel, he says, oh, you know, we were dispatched immediately to come to you. But the prince of Persia was giving us a hard time. So we had to sort him out quickly and kick his butt and then we came. But it took three weeks in natural time. Okay, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and read the book of Daniel. It's a fantastic book. There's a lot more to Daniel than just the lion's den. Um, and the lion's den is a fantastic story as well. And sometimes we should, sometimes we should preach on that too. I mean, that is just a cool story. So like we're singing today about, I've got a lion in me. It's the lion in me that shuts the mouths of the lions around me. What a man, Daniel. Hey, what a man. I mean, there he was. He's like, the, king's, the king gets duped into uh, making a decree that you can't pray to anybody but the king. And Daniel goes, okay, opens the curtains wide, prays in the window so all his enemies can see he's still praying to God. He's like, he's like I almost feel like Daniel was, I mean, I would say he was doing it a little bit on purpose. 
It's like, it's like, okay, cool. Bring it on. I know there's some lions down the road in that dungeon, but bring it on. Whatever happens, happens. Um, they'd already seen enough stuff. Uh, his friends had been thrown in the fire and Jesus had, Jesus had gone and rescued them. So Daniel was like, it, you can't touch me. And even if you do, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be with Jesus. So that's okay. I'm going to pray in the window. Curtains open, nice and, nice and wide. Everyone can see me. You now, the problem with underground churches is they shouldn't be underground. They should be above ground. It's easy to say when you live in South Africa. So we need to pray for people who are, who are struggling in other places and other countries that God will give them the courage that they need to be able to rise up in the spaces and places that they find themselves in. Amen. And I do believe God's going to send some from this room into those places. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what was I talking about? Spend time with Jesus. I, sometimes you'll get an answer straight away. Sometimes you'll get an answer in a month's time. Sometimes maybe it'll take a year, but don't let go. Don't, 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 don't make a decision unless you've heard from him. You're like, well, God's not speaking. Should, you know, should I sell the house? Should I buy the house? Should I move to that place? Should I stay here? Should I get that job? Should I do that? What should, I, I don't know what God is saying. Well, don't make a decision until you know. Don't make a decision until you know. Paul was able to do what he did because he knew it was always, everything he was doing was by the will of God. Okay, you got that. There was, there was a, a, a calling that he had. He knew who he was. And there was an accountability to, if God has called me to do this, I'm accountable to do what he's called me to do. Like, like woe is me if I don't do what he's told me to do. Paul, an apostle, not by the will of men, but by the will of God. To all the saints, I love it. If you have given your life to Jesus, you're a saint. Just turn to the person next to you and say, and then whatever, ask them what the name is if you don't know what the name is, and then say Saint Zinke or Saint, Saint Janine. Okay, okay. Now you're not going to go out and build a shrine. That's not going to happen. But and we're not going to walk around calling everyone saint whoever. That was just a joke. Okay. Um, we, <laughs> let's, not, let's not get weird about these things. But here's the reality is that a saint is a set apart, holy, righteous person. Because of how good you and I have been? Absolutely not. But because of how good Jesus has been. Because of his sacrifice. Because of his sacrifice on the cross, because he paid the price, because the price, because he atoned for our sins, he he opened the way for us to come to the Father. He made peace between us and the Father, and he gave us the gift of righteousness. And so, the moment you say yes to Jesus Christ, the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are as much as a saint as you will be in a hundred years from now. You're a saint. Paul calls them saints. He doesn't call them like, oh, all you guys are kind of like, you know. Barely going to make it to heaven. No, we are barely, we, 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 we are, we, we would not make it to heaven. We actually, in a sense, are barely making it to heaven. It's really just by his grace. But it's amazing that, that what feels like barely is, it's such a, it's almost like a, it's like, sure, it's just by the grace of God, but it's amazing how strong the grace of God is. It is so strong. And so everyone in this room today, if you've given your life to Jesus, you're a saint. You're like, yo, well, you know, I, I got really, really angry this week. I made some really bad choices. I handled things badly at work. I didn't do what you were preaching about last week. I was ungrateful and grumpy. And You're still a saint. You're just a grumpy saint. You're still a saint. You're just making ba a bad decision, saint. You're, still a, you're just an angry saint, but you're still a saint. That, that doesn't change. Like a sinner, if the sinner helps the old lady across the street and does this and does that and does the next thing, that sinner is just a caring, kind sinner, but they're still sinners. They don't, they don't become, they don't become, you know, they, they can't, they can't work their way into heaven. That's, that's just not possible. You can do a whole bunch of amazing things and be, and be uh, incredibly empathetic to people. You just be an empathetic sinner. Does it make sense? You can be a really terrible person, but you can be a terrible saint. It's the truth. You know, you on your worst day, you're not any more righteous than on your best day because it's about him, not about your performance or my performance. So where does that leave us? Well, that leaves us with, okay, well, the pressure's off, first of all, but then as we carry on reading, we go, but his grace is working in me, and therefore there's something that's going to start to work on the outside of me. But let's not water down the reality that what I've just said is true. That doesn't change. And when you're having, you're having a really, really bad day, at some point in that really, really bad day, just stop, reflect, and go, I'm a saint. I'm a son. I'm a daughter. I'm, you know. And the more you 
you you you make that uh, uh, you kind of think of that, think that through and make that a reality in your own mind. We start to change the way we think, and what starts to happen is, you and I know, you start to do things differently. Because if you keep reminding yourself on a bad day who Jesus has made you to be, because it's all about Him, who He's made you to be, then as you continue doing that, what will start to happen is you'll find yourself responding like a saint, more and more. Amen. And if your house is full of saints and you're living with them and you find them constantly making bad decisions, then that's a good moment where one saint says to another saint, hey, listen, the way you're busy handling things right now is having this effect on us. Because God's given us each other to help work on each other. Amen? Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, thank you for being in my life. So, so Paul says saints, and then he says, he says the saints who are faithful in Jesus Christ. Again, I want to remind us, faithfulness is one of the most underrated qualities. Especially in our modern world, our microwave world, our uh, everything must happen 10 minutes ago world. It's like, you know, you, when you pick up your phone, you, you want to order checkers 60-60, but it, oh, it's going to take 60 minutes before they get you. You know, the first week of Checker 6060, it was like such a novelty. Oh, my word. You know, food arrives at the gate. Uh, you know, two months later, we're like, this is so slow. Can't it be like Checker's five minutes, five minutes? You know, I want it and I want it now. We live in the now world and, and we live in the microwave, you know, microwave popcorn. Like, why is it not ready already? Do I have to really put it in the microwave and press the button and wait for one minute? But there is a quality that comes with following Jesus Christ, and that's called faithfulness. It's the long haul when you don't see anything changing. You're going through the same thing over and over and over again. I'm not saying necessarily the same thing that you have created for yourself, because some of us do that too. But even in that, some of the things we've created for ourselves may take time to outwork from our lives. Some decisions that we may have made, may have, may have made I heard somebody say, how you live in your 30s and 40s directly affects how you will live in your 50s. So if you're living in your 50s, you might be saying, I wish I'd heard that when I was in my 30s. But wherever we find ourselves, I'm going, like, I'm in my early 40s, and I'm going, I wish I'd heard that when I was in my 20s. Well, I knew it when I was in my 20s, but when you're in your 20s, you don't really, you know, it's like your 40s feel so far away, right? It's like, have you, have you ever, ever tried to tell your children, you need to learn from my mistakes? And they go like, okay, and then they go make the same mistake, because they still want to make the mistake anyway, because that's the best way for them to learn. Anyway, I say all that to say, there's something about being faithful, about day by day, Working, working out your salvation, just being faithful to what God has called you to do. To do. Be faithful to be obedient, to, to love people around you, to come together as church, to, to just, just the faithfulness of, I'm going to keep serving you, God. I'm going to keep serving you, God. Things may not feel the way I want. They might not be the way I want them to be. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I, I might not be feeling what I feel like I should be feeling. Um, this faith thing can sometimes feel quite hard, but I'm going to just keep going on. I'm going to be faithful. These, these, these saints in Ephesus were faithful. They were faithful. And God has called us to be a faithful church. You know, maybe at some point when they started to lose their, their, their first love, that they, they started to lose that sense of faithfulness, firstly to Jesus and then maybe in other areas of their lives. When you, when you, when you become unfaithful to Jesus, when, and what, what, I, what I mean by that is that he's, he's no longer the, the, the greatest priority in your life and my life. That's when we move into this place where he's no longer our first love. And he needs to be our first love. And we need to be faithful to him and faithful for the long haul. 10 years, 20 years from now, someone asked me a while back, they said, oh, you, are you still there in Margate? I'm like, yeah, still in Margate. It's almost like you, people expect you to be somewhere for a while and then to move. And then to be gone over there. And if, you, if, if your job or the way your life is gone has dictated that you end up moving a lot, that, that's, that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. But there is this interesting thing that will, people will be like, oh, are, you, are, you, you still, are you still there? Are you still in that job? Yo, that's, called, that's called faithfulness, guys. Next time someone says to you, oh, you're still there, just, just, just say, yeah, I'm still there. And then as you walk away, say, thank you, Lord, for, for growing faithfulness in my life, and I'm going to keep being faithful. I'm going to keep being faithful. If, if in five years' time someone says, are you still there? I'm like, yep. Yeah still being faithful to what God has called me to. That, that's, that's, it's, there's nothing glamorous about faithfulness. But I'm so grateful for faithfulness because it's because of Jesus' faithfulness that you and I get to be with him for eternity. Imagine if Jesus just, depending on how he felt about you and I on that day, oh, I don't feel so good about you today. Imagine if, if he operated that way towards us. 
I'm so grateful for his faithfulness. And that's the example of faithfulness that we're called to live in. Amen? And then in verse 2, it says, grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. Grace is such a beautiful word. There's a saving grace of God where, where he gives you and I what we do not deserve, salvation. We get this gift called righteousness. There's this saving grace. But then there's also this empowering grace that it empowers you and I to live the impossible Christian life. What was impossible for you and I to do one moment becomes possible the next moment because of the grace of God in our lives. Not because of how clever you are, not because of any other, any, anything that you and I have or haven't done, but because of his grace in our lives. Paul says, I worked harder than the rest, yet not I, but the grace of God was working in me. So every letter that Paul writes, you can read it through the New Testament, when he says, when he greets the saints in, a various, in, in various places, he says, grace to you and peace. And the reason for that is we need grace and we need peace. The peace starts off with, I've been reconciled to God. That's where peace begins. Every morning when you wake up, you wake up going, I'm not God's enemy. I'm at peace with God. I'm at peace with God. I've, I've been brought near. I've been brought close. I'm at peace with God. You can wake up in the morning and say, God, thank you that I have peace with you. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that you give me that I carry into my day today. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give me to do what you've called me to do. And Paul knows how important this is. So he would write these letters, and as he wrote them, he would say, grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace. And I want to encourage you and encourage myself this morning. Let's, these words need to be in our prayer time. That we're praying for more grace. We're praying for more peace. We're praying, praying for people around us. Praying for our families. Praying for friends. Praying for those who don't know Jesus. Pray that God will extend His grace to them. That they will, that they will experience His peace. That they will, they will step into a place of peace with God. Amen? Grace and peace. Peace really is. Some of you were laughing away during worship. Isn't that amazing? Um, if you think that's weird, try living in the book of Acts. In, in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit fell on them that day. That was weird. And that's in the Bible. And uh, there's some other strange things in the Bible. And so uh, every now and then, if you're, if you're like me, you know, like, oh, that's quite strange. But then I look at the Bible and go, well, you know, God seems to be okay with a lot of things. So kind of just, you know, that's cool. Um, I don't understand that, but that's cool. You know, God can work things out. You know, what I love about the Bible is that God's also not, um, he's not intimidated by your mom's mistakes. You know, he doesn't like bite his fingernails when Solomon goes and marries a thousand women. <laughs> he doesn't uh, he doesn't get he doesn't like get all panicky when you know uh abraham creates an ishmael you know he, he god is god is uh, god is okay with the mistakes of our story what he's looking for is faith and faith looks like faithfulness as you move forward amen it's faith that pleases him i feel like i was saying something else and then that went out of my head so we'll just carry on Grace and peace. Then as Paul starts to write this letter to them, he, it's, it's like he's, he's, there's so much inside of him that wants to burst out of him. And so he just bursts into worship. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Worship always comes first. You must remember that it's about God first before it's about your my spiritual blessing. He says, blessed be God who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We've got to watch also how we talk and the songs we sing and how we communicate with each other, that, we're not that God's not just some genie in a bottle that we rub every now and then to get him to do something for us. It is all about him. And as we look at him and as we gaze at him, he is glorious, he is wonderful, he is marvelous. And as we look at him, as we keep gazing at him, the more we discover of him. But in that, there are spiritual blessings that he has given us. But we don't, we don't look to the blessings, we look to him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Isn't that amazing? Every spiritual blessing, everything you and I could possibly need or ask for on this planet, you've already been blessed with. It's already in your bank account. You and I have to just learn how to access that bank account. But it's all already available to you and to me. Amazing. Every spiritual blessing, everything that we need, every resource that you and I need to fulfill the assignment of God on our lives, He has already given it to us. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then Paul says, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him. He chose us. John 15 verse 16 says, I did not choose you, but you, no, sorry. 
You did not choose me, <laughs> but I chose you. Jesus chose us. You sit here this morning. Again, it's a reminder. We're objects of the grace and the love and affection of God. We don't sit here because of our cleverness. You're in this building today not by accident. You're in this building because Jesus chose you. Jesus chose me. Every single one of us. Amen? He chose us in him. Before the foundation of the world, now before your parents had even thought about you, before any of us were even a thought here on this planet, he had chosen us. You did not choose me, Jesus says, but I chose you. We're here today because he chose us. We're here today because he loves us. We're here today because we're the objects of his affection. He is so kind and so gracious to us. That is a good thing to remember on any day of the week. He chose me. He chose me. Oh, I feel like such a failure today. Well, you know what? He chose me. So he's going to work this thing out in my life. He's, oh, I'm, I made such a mess in this situation. But he chose me. And so I'm going to come to him and repent and say, God, help me. I need your grace for this area. And God's going to help me because he chose me. And he doesn't just leave us to our own devices and our own mistakes. He will come and he'll step and he'll say, hey, let's clean this up together. Hey, I'm not leaving. Not, don't go and sort yourself out and then come to me. Invite me in and we'll sort this out together. It's because he chose us. He loves us. He's for us. He's not against us. He's promised to never leave us, never forsake us. Amen. He chose us. He chose us. That really should affect our lives in a quite a dramatic way. You wake in the morning, I am chosen by the Father. I am chosen. He moved heaven and earth to bring me back into his family. Wow. When did he choose us? Before the foundation of the earth. Why did he choose us? The verse goes on to say, he chose us for holiness. He chose us for holiness. Holiness, to be holy means to be set apart. It means to be like God. Sometimes we think holiness is like God to be all serious. Uh, Jesus was full with joy above his companions. Holiness looks like extreme joy. Holiness looks like extreme kindness and gratitude and love and empathy. It's, it, is, it is the full package of who God is that you and I have got very little comprehension of, but we are stepping into a little bit of us. But he chose us to be, and you know what's amazing? He says, okay, cool. Here's the race you're going to run. And there's a, fit, a, start, a finish line at the end. And some of us maybe have this picture in our mind, minds of when we get across the finish line, we'll then be holy. He says, okay, here's the race you're going to run. I've got, I've got some work for you to do. But from the start line, at the start, I make you holy. Now you get to run as a holy person. And as you're running, you're figuring out what this feels like. And you have a bad days and you have good days, but you're figuring out what this feels like. And more and more of what he's already given you, spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, is starting to, starting to grow something on the inside of you and me. And, we, and we're beginning to become more and more like who he said when the, gun, when the, the starting gun went off, he, he already placed it all inside of you and me. That's amazing. That's like, that's like if he's given all that to us, he, he knows we're going to finish. And he knows we're going to finish because he's going to help us finish, not because he's leaving us to our own devices. Amen? I was so encouraged. I saw Linda now. She came to me before the service, and she said her daughter-in-law and son have just been to a meeting in the UK where there were 40,000 people worshiping Jesus in one place. I thought I'd mention that, just in case some of you think the UK has gone down the drain. 40,000 people worshiping Jesus in one place. That is, that is so incredibly encouraging. God is moving all over the planet. And what he has started, he's going to finish. Amen? I want to really encourage you. Every time you hear the word holy, put a massive smile on your face. Because unfortunately, the word holy has be, developed this connotation of seriousness. And, 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 and all of that. It, it's all sort of, it's, uh, often what we call holy, is we've actually just, it's, it's something that's very religious and strange. It's strangeness, actually. And extreme religion. It's, holiness is, is being like Jesus. Jesus was, I mean, can you imagine just being with, walking with him down the road and just the things that would take place and being in a house with him and then guys are opening the roof to drop people down. Like, life was pretty exciting with Jesus around. Life's pretty exciting when you live holy. But you, you're living holy because he made you holy. He made you before the foundation of the earth. He chose you and I to be holy. Then he sent Jesus to the cross to die on the cross, sacrifice for our sins. So when you said yes to Jesus, he said, you're holy. 
Now go and run the race I've given you to run. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're a saint. Now go and do what I've called you to do. There's an exciting life for you, but it's not a life of trying to figure out how to be holy. You are holy, and off you go. Amen? That's very cool. And then it says, He chose us before the foundation of the earth that we should be holy without blame before Him in love. I think that in love is also just a reminder because often, um, I'm sure some of you have, have been around environments where in the name of holiness there's very little love. That's what I'm talking about. It's like holiness that has no love is just religion. It's form without power. It's going through the motions. But there's, the Holy Spirit's not there. He's, he's like a dove. He's, he's flown off. He's gone somewhere else. And so he says, it's, uh, um, he, he called us to be holy. He chose us to be holy, blameless before him. Jesus did that work. In love. It's got to be in love. It's got to be in love. If love is the motivating factor in your life and my life, if love is the thing that compels us, holiness will look like Jesus and not look like religion. And again, why did he choose us? He goes on to say, for sonship. We were chosen to be adopted, predestined us to adoption as sons. He chose us to be sons. And we've said this many times before. I wanted to just say to the ladies, the guys get to be the bride of Christ for all eternity. The ladies, you get to be sons of God. Pretty cool. So we're the bride. You're sons. So we're all in this together. It's pretty exciting. Pretty cool. So sons, he chose us for sonship, adopted as sons. And he did this because he delights in us. It says because of the good pleasure of his will. He delights in us. He delighted to make you and I sons of God. There's such a delight to God. And when he thinks about you and he thinks about me, the Bible tells us the thoughts that he thinks towards us are greater than the sands of the seashore. He loves us so much more than you and I could possibly think or even imagine. It's in, in the come, Paul says when you come together, you, you're trying to understand the height, the depth, the width, the breadth of his love. It's like you can't even figure it out alone. You have to do it together. You have to do it as a group because it's just so vast, the love that God has for us. And it's that love that compels us when we step out of this building and we go into our lives out there. It's that same love that compels us to live in a certain way. It's not because I'm trying to prove a point or be something or try and be holy. But I am, I am holy, getting out there loving people because he loves me so much. Amen? He chose us for sonship. Sons do business on the Father's behalf. We get to go out there and we get to do business on behalf of God. We're part of the family business. You and I are in the family business. You know, the next time someone asks you what you do, you just say, I'm in the family business. Well, what, what do you do? Well, we take over schools. We take over hospitals. We take over businesses and nations. Just kind of anywhere that needs help, we take over. We're in the takeover business. It's a family business. It's a takeover business. It's the kingdom. That's ever increasing. It's ever increasing. Amen? Sons do business on the Father's behalf. Sons can sign. They can agree. They can disagree. They can go into meetings on behalf of the Father. They can, some, of you, some of you know what that feels like even in your own family business. You've empowered your children to be able to do things on your behalf. God has done that for us. He's entrusted. I mean, he entrusted the world to those 12 disciples. If he could do it with them, he could do it with us. And those disciples, you look at them and you're like, Peter, oh my goodness, did God really, like, he, like he really, he chose Peter. Um, I'm so grateful he chose Peter because there's hope for me. Because sometimes I also think, I also speak before I think. Sometimes I also do before I think. I mean, I look at Peter and I go, Yo, you know, I can so see myself doing what Peter does on a regular basis. And God just keeps coming back and just keeps helping and keeps, keeps guiding and keeps directing. But he's entrusted the world to you and to me. He says, go out, make disciples, be witnesses of me. He's chosen us as sons. Amen? Are you guys still doing okay? It's, uh, it's still eight minutes to 11. So I've got eight minutes before I go into overtime. <laughs> Why did he choose us? So he chose us for holiness. He chose us for sonship. And he chose us for worship. He chose us for worship. It says, let me read the verses so you can hear it. He, verse 4, he chose us in him that we will be holy. Verse 5, predestined us to adoptions as sons. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, for which he made us accepted in, his, in the beloved. He chose us for worship. That's why when we come together on a Sunday morning and the music starts, we have to worship. No one's holding a gun to your head or to my head. It's just who we are. It's what he's made us to be. We have to worship because he chose us for that. Before the foundation of the earth, 
to give him worship. For to the glory, what does it say? To the praise of the glory of his grace. Where we don't step into holiness, when we don't step into sonship, that's a dishonor to God. But when we live out that holiness that he's given us, we live out that sonship that he's given us, that's what brings him glory. That's what brings him honor. That's worship. That's what it looks like to worship beyond the songs we sing. Living as sons, living as holy sons, doing business on behalf of our Father. That's worship. The work that you and I do every single day is worship when we do it with him. Amen? We worship him through stepping into our identities as sons. We worship him through living holy. We worship him by living in a way that is set apart. We look different from the world because of Jesus. We can't look the same as the world, right? We, we, just, we just do look different. And sometimes people may think you are a little bit weird, but that's okay. That's okay. You know why? Because we're citizens of another kingdom. We're like stars that shine in the universe. You know, you don't, you don't want, you, 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 if you're the star that shines, shines, you're going to stand out a little bit. Amen? God's glorious grace is praised when we live as holy sons. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. I just I love the reminder there again. He made us accepted in the beloved. It's you and I are accepted in Jesus. Not because of your good works or my good works. We're accepted in Jesus. In Jesus, we're accepted. Like you're sitting here today, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past looks like, no matter the mistakes you're going to make into the future, for any of us in this room, we're accepted in Jesus. And he loves us. Amen? And we've only just got going in this letter. We're only on verse 6. <laughs> when we truly understand how much God delights in us, our response can only be but to step into all he's called us to. By his grace, we are accepted in, his, in the beloved. By his grace, we're accepted in Jesus. The Father accepts you and me this morning. He accepts us as his sons. You can't add to it. You can't work for it. You just are accepted. In the beloved. There's nothing that you and I can do except just live. Live as a son. For the, for the sake of it, let me say, live as sons and daughters. Live as part of his family. Just live out who he's made you to be. Amen? So he chose us for holiness. Holiness means to be like him. He chose us for sonship, to represent him. He chose us for worship, to glorify him. What a way to start a letter. What a way to write to a group of people. And in, the same, in a sense, you can just picture Paul sitting there writing his letter. He, wrote, he was writing from prison. He tells us that he's in prison. Later on, he says he's, in, he's, in, he's, he's imprisoned. Um, but he writes this letter to these, to these saints. And he's, 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 not, he's not writing from a place of, oh, you know, I'm so sad I'm in this place. He's writing just so overwhelmed by God's goodness towards those people. And in the same way, you can picture him writing towards you and me today. Saying, hey, you, we've been accepted in the Beloved. He's made us holy. He's made us sons. He's made us for worship. What a way to get on with the week. Amen? Let's stand. Lord Jesus, if um, we forget everything that was said this morning, I pray, Lord, that we'll still just walk out of here with this absolute knowledge of how much you love us and that we are accepted 